be the standard. And the rest of the European musicians kind of fell into line within the next generation. And by the 19, by close to 1900, they had, there was pretty much international agreement that equal temperament is the way to go. Now what equal temperament e means is they don't, um, don't adjust the tuning for the best sound. They don't optimize the tuning for one particular key. They, they set the tuning so that the only intervals that are what they call perfect are the octaves. Right. But within what they do is they adjust the tuning of the other notes so that they're off a little bit, but they're off the same little bit in every key. And what this does is for composers is it opens up the palette of musical sound, if you'll allow me to mix the metaphors, so that they can bring in keys and they can bring in tonalities and sounds that they've not been able to play before. Because sure. no other temperament system allows you to use all 27 different keys, or however many the number is. It's close to that. So that's one, that's one thing that's going to be a real issue for the downtime musicians and even the downtimers who aren't musicians but happen to have good hearing, good musical ears. The up, <coughs> some of the uptime music is just flat going to sound weird because it's in keys nobody uses. It'll sound like a poorly tuned piano. like a. And the other thing is because it's equal temperament and nothing is perfect, every key is going to sound off and some of it is going to have that effect. So bringing the whole concept of equal temperament back to the 1600s, are they going to adopt that right off the bat? Of course not. <laughs> they're going to argue they're, about it for 500 years. Yeah, they're, <laughs> there's going to be more arguments. There's going to be more flame wars. There are going, there are going to be some musicians who land on the side of the uptimer music authority, and there's going to be some musicians who reject it because we didn't think of it, or because I have so much invested in this other method that I've been promoting for my entire professional career that I can't back down now. But it's going to have almost a spiritual authority to some people that 400 years later, this is what they were doing, and this is what all the great music was written in, and it's going to be hard to <coughs> successfully argue against it for more than a generation. You're not suggesting that um, Schoenberg is going to win. <laughs> Schoenberg? Of course not. <laughs> but the <laughs> brass players being able to play in any key with bell instruments are going to be a huge pressure on these guys. You know, they're going to go, boo! <laughs> actually, the, in the modern day, the wind players are the ones who don't like equal temperament because, the, because they want the, the just temperament. So, right. Because you, a wind instrument or a string instrument, all you got to do is change your embouchure, move your lip a little bit, move your finger on the string, change your finger on the string, and you're in two. Except it's, on a guitar. Yeah. Well, <laughs> except on a guitar. But, unless you play a fretless guitar. But the keyboard people are the ones who really, 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 really like the, the equal temperament because they can do everything, yes. Uh, one thing, you're speaking about the music professionals mm -hmm. of the era. Uh, well, there aren't very many listening amateurs. Is this an issue with them? Do, do they also have this uh, uh, hearing things as being off uh, because it's, they're not used to it? They will, they will, the ones who have musically sensitive ears, they will recognize <coughs> the difference, but they won't know what the difference, uh, many of them will not know what the difference is from. They'll just know it sounds weird. Okay. And I have more on that thought in a minute. <coughs> so temperament. That's one thing that's coming back. That's one thing. Rock in the middle of the pond and ripples are going to go out like crazy. Is it going to like feed flames to the flame war that's going on Oh, already? absolutely. 
That's but I think the, all in the flame. But I think the flame wars will be shorter. I don't think they will continue on till till because the they see an end to it. They see an end yeah. because that this will come back. This will have, as I said, an almost spiritual authority when it comes back. It's going to be hard to argue against Brahms, against Wagner, against Mahler, and Bruckner, and Chopin, and these guys. It's Tchaikovsky. going to be hard to argue against the C sharp minor waltz by, by Frederick Chopin. And yeah, that, is a, key, that is a key they could not use in the down no. because it would not sound good in the other temperament scales. Okay, second thing, before I, before I get into the music, second thing. Um, the actual pitch is different. The international standard today for pitch, the A up here <coughs> is 440 hertz. That was standardized by international agreement, I think, in the 1890s. Prior to that, it was around A415, and I think that was actually stabilized in the 1840s, somewhere around there. Prior to that, it was even lower. As best I can tell, in the early 1600s, there was not an international consensus, but as best I can tell, A was probably around 380. Wow. 390. God, it sure sounds different. Yeah, this is, this is going to mean that when they listen to recordings of music from their era that are performed in the modern day, it's gonna sound a half step, a whole step, maybe even a minor third higher than they're used to hearing. And it means that when they try to perform music printed on, in the uptime manner, in uptime you know, you know, sheet music, it's not going to sound the same because they're used to see it's going to feel like a stretch because they're used to singing an A much lower than it really is. So this is, you know, what kind of effect is, is this going to have? I don't know. I haven't written the story. Nobody's written the story. Maybe only but the people But is it going to have an effect? You betcha. Again, rock in the middle of the pond, ripples going across Europe. <coughs> Standardized music notation, big difference, big change, because they were groping, you know, every printer had slightly different methodology, every composer had slightly different methodology for, for notating music and preparing it for print. We're bringing back a consistent methodology of printing music, that's going to make a big change. <coughs> They were like <coughs> using lines and notes, though, weren't they? They were. Yeah. But standardizing the the symbols, standardizing the the staff Step. and the and the, the treatment of notes and measures and so on, will have a long term effect on music. Yeah. Again, how quickly will they be adopted? I don't know. But it will, it will have, and they may eventually settle on a slightly different standard. They don't necessarily have to totally adopt the, the uptime standard 100%, everybody fall into lockstep behind it and move forward. There may be flame wars about notation. But this will drive them to an accepted standard faster because they've got one, they've got a model from the uptime that will drive them to it. A compromise. Okay, now, before I start on the actual music, this is not the Renaissance. This is the early Baroque era. Johann Sebastian Bach is late Baroque. He was born in 1685. We are 50 years before that. To these people, Johann Sebastian Bach would sound like Dave Blumeck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the Blue Man Group. The <laughs> yeah. He would be considered jazz. He would be considered very avant-garde to the people of 1632. Even to the professional musicians 
and the highly cultured nobility and church prelates, he would be considered very avant-garde. Who? So you have to change to a different mindset. When, when you want to think about writing music in, the, in this story time frame, you have to bring your mind back to a totally different mindset as to what music sounded like then. Because music, unlike technology, technology is very fact-oriented. It either works or it doesn't. It either uses this or it doesn't. Or it uses this instead of this, but it still works. Music is, is totally different. Music, perception of music is very emotional, and there's a very big psychological component to it. The fact that we listen to something that we consider to be very plain vanilla music does not at all mean that somebody from another culture would have that same reaction when they heard that piece of music. If you took somebody from, oh, let's say, uh, let's say you could pick up somebody from Micronesia in 1912, and you could pick him up in your transporter, and you could drop him in a music hall in New York City in 1912, when they're in the middle of doing a Jerome Kern show, what do you think his reaction is going to be? Yeah. You know, what, It'll be what, what is this? What, you know, what, what am I hearing? This is noise. This is noise. This is not. This is not music like we do it back on the island. <coughs> of course, if you took someone from the, the the orchestra and dropped them in Micronesia, they might have the same reaction. Exactly true. Exactly true. So. There will be a certain amount of that in play when downtimers begin to listen to music that comes from the uptime. There is not a wealth of sheet music Great. in Grantville. I mean, there there is some. There, there's music in the churches. There's music in the high school um, and school system music rooms. There's music in piano benches all over town, even if nobody's played the piano since Grandma died 30 years ago. They're still music sitting there. there. But in comparison to the wealth of music that exists today, the subset of printed music that's actually in Grantville is going to be relatively small. So it's going to be difficult to justify anything really out there musically, you know, somebody finding a, sheet, a piece of the sheet music. There are, however, recordings, and depending, you know, it, what kind of music you want to find, you might be able to justify somebody having a record of something. And it is, particularly in that time frame, it was a, a valued musical skill among musicians to be able to listen to something and write, write it down, notate it on paper. Uh, for example, uh, Mozart is always an extreme, extreme case to compare to anything musically, but uh, he was, I believe it was, uh, I think it was the Monteverdi Vespers that he went, nobody had ever written it down, no, I mean, they. The choir sang it, but it was not available in music anywhere. You you learned it, but from singing with the choir, they just well, taught either it. that or they had copies that never left the church, and you were you were shot if you tried to leave with it. Right. And, but the the, mu the the actual physical music for the thing was not publicly available in any way, 